Uh, welcome, everybody, to our City Council Port Authority concurrent meeting, Monday, July 31st, 2023. I'd like to call the City Council portion of this meeting to order. And I would like to call the Port Authority portion to order. And thanks, everybody, for being here. We've got a, a, a good group, especially a good group in, in the house here. So welcome to everybody. Looking forward to the presentations tonight. Remind uh, everybody around the table that in order to speak, you have to push the button and the green light's got to come on on the microphone in front of you. And then after you're done speaking, if you could turn it off again, it, uh, it, it cuts down on the background chatter and makes it a little bit cleaner in the recording and for the folks watching. Our first order of business tonight is the approval of minutes. Uh, I will ask the city council, are there any questions or additions or subtractions to the minute this, this evening? If not, Council, I would look for a motion to approve the December 7th, 2022 Council Port Authority concurrent meeting minutes. So moved. Second. And a motion by Councilmember D'Alessandro, second by Councilmember Martin to approve the minutes from December 7th, 2022. No further City Council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 4-0. <clears throat> and I would like to have entertain a similar motion for the Port Authority. So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Peterson. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Hunt. Any additions or corrections? If not, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Post. Motion carries 5-0. And maybe 6-0 with Rob here. <laughs> second item on our agenda is uh, organizational business, and we've got a presentation regarding our Small Business De Development Center. Uh, excuse me, Small Business Center. And uh, Carla Henderson and Barb Wolf are here to kick us off. And I know we've got some exciting news and looking forward to seeing what the updates are on this. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. President, council members and commissioners. It's been about seven months since we've been before you. And there has been a lot of work that has ha happened. Um, and so we were sitting around and this concurrent meeting came up and I thought this is a great time for us to come up here and share our work and bring some friends along because we've got a lot to share. Um, so kick it over to Barb. Uh, yeah, so when we were here last before in December, uh, one thing that I want to address, I came before you in uh, special projects and initiatives, and now I'm in the Port Authority, so focusing my work uh, with the business uh, community. Uh, I think a lot of what we're going to talk about will come up in the slides later on, so I'll give those updates at a later point. Um, but with that, I would like to introduce Fran DiCaprio from uh, Formula, who is our lead ar architect on this project. Good evening, Mr. DiCaprio, welcome. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm Fran DiCaprio. Uh, I'm a designer at Formula, um, and I'm actually stepping in for Paula Sanchez, who is out of town. She's been the uh, project manager for this, so I'm coming in a little last minute to you know, present our work for you today. Um, so Formula is led by um, uh, Nathan and James, and you know, Paula has been managing this project. This is a list of uh, some of our collaborators. Um, I think for now I can just hand it over to Alliance to talk about the interior work that they've been doing for the project. Good evening and welcome. Good to see you again. Hi. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just maybe follow up a little bit. I'm Julie McLeod with Alliance, and this is Greta Froster with Alliance, and we are partnered with Formula Architects, um, kind of a joint design venture um, together. We're both, both architectural firms, and Greta and I and our team have been working closely with the, on the interior portions of the building. And so we're going to start off with a little introduction to the ideas behind the building <coughs> once we find our slide. Yeah. <laughs> so
automatically advancing it to the end. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. That was a suspenseful moment here. <laughs> um, well, thank you for letting us join you. Um, like Julie said, we are really excited to share this project with you. Um, we worked with the advisory committee um, several times, and what continued to resonate with us was this connection to the existing fire station, right, and really appreciating what that meant. And so as we were building our concept and going through these meetings and talking about what the space was going to become, we reflected on the importance of a fire station in the community. It's foundational, right? Um, it's iconic. It's recognizable. And so what does that translate into the future? And looking at the small business center as the future to support the community and local Bloomington residents, it seemed like there was a strong connection between fire department, fire station, and um, supporting a community and the small business center. So what you can see, very small on the screen, is the building outline. And what's really wonderful about this building is that it's it used to house vehicles, and so it was very large, open interior, and the vehicles drove in one side and out the other, and so there were a lot of openings, and we felt like hearing what the advisory committee was interested in, it really gave this opportunity to really open the building up, both to connect with the community, but also to kind of expand the available space. I think very quickly we discovered that we had maybe twice as many ideas as we could fit inside the building. And so by allowing this building to be really open, to maximize that open quality of the building as it stands today, we had this opportunity to really kind of expand the program um, inside and out, even though this is Minnesota and we know that sometimes the weather does not cooperate. So generally, um, we kept a core of uh, plumbing kinds of features, the, the restrooms, where the plumbing was in the building today and kind of off to the side, and then really allowed the central portions of the building to open up and house different programs. And the plan that you see up in the upper part, it looks like it's a series of rooms, and there is the opportunity to enclose it as a room, but you can actually move those walls. So the idea is to be able to move the walls and open up that space. So you can make a small classroom, you can make a large classroom, or you can make one really large space that's capable of gathering uh, groups of people together. And then in the third bay or the western side of the building are smaller spaces for incubator studios, one-on-one um, -on -one work, um, small huddle rooms. You know, so really trying to provide a range of opportunities, a range of activities that could happen in the building um, and allow that to change over the course of the day. So rooms that are used for a classroom in the morning could be used for a studio space in the afternoon. And so really trying to maximize the use of that space. So generally speaking, it's a big open palette of opportunities within the building with some supporting spaces, including a, a work cafe and um, restrooms and showers. Um, so Greg is going to tell us a little bit more about really the kind of the fun part of <laughs> the building. Sure. So this is like a co-working space. I mean, many of you may have um, you know, set up shop there. Um, and so when we were looking at the next slide shows um, some of those inspiration images. And what we liked about this is, you know, these are precedent images talking about the character of space that this um, co-working space can become. We know it's an industrial building, right? And so um, how do we um, preserve that and enhance it? So you'll notice um, kind of that open plan, open concept, um, exposed fixtures. Um, so we're we're thinking about that in this space. We also like, as Julie said, um, that openness and that connection to daylight. It's really important as humans and as we work um, to be exposed to good daylight. So um, we've got plenty of opportunity. Another thing that I think these images really show and what we did in the space was to focus on color and um, kind of a way of uh, wayfinding or identifying spaces, um, creating privacy, um, 
also presenting kind of social cues to what behavior is expected. So on the earlier plan, we saw kind of a quiet uh, workspace, and then we've got a very um, open, collaborative work zone. So those colors um, are a little bit more vibrant, a little bit more active, and when you go into that quiet space, they're a little bit more subdued in the materials. Um, we also like the vibrancy of the color. That to us and the advisory committee um, really represents uh, the city of Bloomington. And so we wanted to embrace that. Um, and so that's, you know, one of those kind of inspiration points was that um, those primary colors found in that first slide that I talked about around the fire station. Um, if you advance to the next slide, you'll see um, those kind of the palette. So um, introducing texture and pattern and color um, in deliberate ways um, to help kind of uh, for people to understand um, you know, where quiet is found, um, where active is found to engage. Um, also, a real opportunity within this building for the community to um, present art and um, we've got a couple places where rotating exhibits uh, will be housed. Um, we also are really focusing on kind of the identity of the space and the interest of the space. So um, City of Bloomington is working hard to do that as well. Um, and you'll see that the materiality is pretty simple. Um, I think that was intentional as well. Um, we want the space and the people inside it to engage it and to be active. And that the space could really be both a studio or a production kind of, or a, you know, a development kind of space, but it also can become that showcase to share the things that um, the members are producing or creating within that space. So it really can flex between those two functions as well. Yep. <laughs> Fran's gonna take over and talk more about the exterior portion of the building. Okay, I brought some samples from our office. Uh, so I keep turning around to see what I'm actually looking at on the screen here. Uh, but on the screen, there's a sample of some uh, metal panels that we've been looking at for the project. So um, if you're familiar with the existing building, you know, currently there's uh, just kind of like this continuous brick material on all sides. And so we've been exploring ways to, you know, um, not do too many radical changes, but kind of take what we have there and, and uh, add a new dimension to it. So one thing we've been exploring is, is these perforated metal panels that Formula has used on many other projects. Um, and there's a lot of uh, opportunities that come from that. So there's, it can come in a variety of um, colors, and you'll see what we have in some, in some of the vendors, what we've gone with so far, as well as a variety of like perforations. So these are some samples from Bach metals um, of just some things that we were looking at. And so there are some standard patterns that you can see here, but then there's also potential to do some custom stuff. Um, and it becomes like the panels become an art opportunity uh, that can go on all sides of the building. Um, and we're particularly looking at incorporating it onto the front face of the building. We got some, some renders coming up, but you can kind of see what these look like. And they're, they have a very clean aesthetic, but also very easy to maintain when they're installed, so uh, hopefully it'll be a good fit for the project. Uh, am I in control here? How do I do? You can be. Next slide. Oh, okay. Advance with that one. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is some uh, previous work by Formula. So it's Juxtaposition Arts, a new art center in Minneapolis, and this just got its grand opening this weekend. There was a great party that we were able to attend. Um, and, and Just is very happy. I mean, Just is, you know, you're probably aware they're doing engagement work for this project. So you can see in these images what I was talking about with those perforated metal panels um, and how we have these red panels on that project and they become, you know, this art opportunity. So Roger Cummings, uh, one of the main guys at Juxtaposition designed this continuous pattern that runs along the, the, the front and side of the building. Um, and so there's a potential to, you know, engage an artist to do similar work for this project. Um, and then you can also see on Great River Landing, um, so the inside of that, uh, of where that entrance is, is also a, a similar metal panel that became an art opportunity. 
And then you can also see the incorporation of LEDs in this project. They're also on juxtaposition arts, although these photos aren't showing that LED integration, but it becomes this uh, beacon, essentially. It turns the building into a beacon that can attract people, light up at night, um, and, and become just a real you know, icon in that neighborhood, right? <clears throat> So these are some renders um, from, from the project. And so you can see the white material that we have on the front uh, is that perforated metal panel. It's, it's hard to see at this resolution, but um, you can see how that it, get, it can get overlaid directly onto the brick, and it provides this interesting screen and creates a nice texture. Right. Um, the other material that you'll see highlighted is uh, it looks kind of gray on the screen, but it's a blue metal panel. Uh, and so this is like a sample of that in a different color. What we're looking at is, uh, is by Centria. They make these metal panels. And so it would go over the building, uh, currently where like the, the roof is on the building. So we'd be removing that roof and then attaching this, this blue metal panel um, that wraps around the building. Um, and, it, and the metal panel, uh, and this panel can also become um, it can serve two purposes. So on the west face of the building, there's like a sort of parking area. And, and by, uh, see, it can be painted over or graphic can be applied onto this metal panel. So there can be a sort of wayfinding uh, on that face of the building. Because if you're parking, we want to make sure that people know where the entrance is. So there can be an opportunity to have graphics to direct people to the entrance, as well as potentially an art opportunity. So that's been discussed in some meetings of um, there's different ways it can be done, but either a vinyl applied graphic or paint could be done onto a panel like this to create an exterior art opportunity. Um, a few final things to call out is, so you can see on that main, uh, on the south face of the building, where we have these large doors from the fire station, we're looking at incorporating these um, folding docking, uh, door, a, a docking door system. We've explored, um, uh, there's a couple products that can serve that purpose, but it'd be a collapsible door um, that can basically open up the space and it can, you know, create this, uh, uh, you know, transparency or like um, a, a porous, you know, dividing the wall between the exterior and the interior. And as, in doing so, it can really activate that front patio space that we're creating in this building where it can be a place for, um, you know, whether it's just like casually meeting or having lunch or having larger gatherings. And because it's in the front and the back, you can imagine situations, whether permitting, where those doors open up and you have like a clear view through the building and it creates, you know, just a sense of like this, this open volume that connects the entirety of the site, right? Um, and I believe there's incorporation of a similar kind of wall in the, uh, in some of the meeting spaces inside that you may have seen on that plan that Alliance was talking through earlier. Um, finally, yeah, just the LEDs, you can start to see how that's being integrated on that canopy in front. So that'd be a custom canopy that, we'll, that we're gonna, that we've already designed, we have to you know, finish detailing. Um, and they can connect to some of the stairs that are along that west face of the building where, again, we want to you know, make sure there's clear wayfinding for people arriving at the site and entering to the front or to the back. And so LED integration can happen there to bring people into those uh, gathering spaces. So I believe that's it for me. We can pass it over to Pat O'Neill to talk through uh, a, uh, what we're looking at for the um, skylights. Good evening, Mr. O'Neill. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I got a few show and tell items. Uh, so my name is Pat O'Neill. I'm with Daylight Specialists. Um, we're a top-down daylighting company, and when I say that, it's our main focus is um, is skylights. Okay. Now, whether that be a traditional skylight, glass, or plastic, or fiberglass sandwich panel, um, or a hybrid skylight, which we will be talking about today, and that is a tubular daylight device. How many people in here have ever heard of a solo tube? A lot of people. Okay, this is great. Um, so it's solar tube residential, much larger. Okay, so we're going to focus on that. Um, our main brands that we use for skylights are, are Velux, Sun Optics, and of course solar tube, which we'll talk about tonight. Um, before we get much further, um, I'd like to just 
Oop, I can go to the slide here. Now, people, a few people have mentioned daylight, and it's really important, um, especially in today's design and design standards. Um, so let's just focus on that for one second, because um, it's really, really critical in the way you deliver daylight, and that's the difference between a hybrid skylight and a traditional skylight. Traditional skylight diffuses or spreads the light into the room at a much higher level, at the maybe roof level or slightly above, tubular daylighting device, harness that, drives it down a pipe, and then diffuses it or delivers it much deeper into the space. So daylight is really important, and tubular daylighting devices, TDDs as I'll refer to them time to time, allow in the 400 to 700 nanometers of the visible light spectrum. And that is the, the full spectrum lighting that we can see, the colors of the rainbow, right? We're blocking out the ultraviolet, 400, 380, 400 nanometers and lower, and then the infrared, so the heat. And that little block of light is the light that affects our circadian rhythm, which determine our sleep cycle, immune system functionality, and our growth and development. Very important there. Now, within that 400 to 700 nanometers, a lot of people aren't aware that melatonin, a hormone produced by the body, is suppressed around 460. So when your body gets that nice dose of daylight, the serotonin, which is another hormone produced by the body, starts kicking in, and that gets the production of our neurotransmitters going. And that affects our moods, our natural thought processes, and our ability to learn and retain information. And it's great for schools, offices, boardrooms, whatever it may be. How did we advance to the next slide? I'm not quite sure how that happened. Um, so I was just going to show on the previous slide, we do have these, these tubes also do allow in the proper daylight to accommodate plant life. So if somebody sets a plant underneath it, they're able to sustain that plant life. Oh, it went back. There it is right there. Yeah. I didn't touch it. <laughs> okay. So uh, if anybody's ever been in the Emory Hotel in downtown Minneapolis, it's a bioflick design. It's, it's a kind of a one-of-a-kind a design that's, that's daylit with tropical plants in the middle of downtown Minneapolis, so it's kind of neat. So let's talk about tubular daylighting devices. So what we do is we harness daylight up on the roof, and this dome right here is a 21-inch dome, and this is what we're looking at for the majority of the tubes in this project. Um, it uses a Fresnel lens design, Fresnel lens invented for the lighthouse to harvest in daylight and direct daylight in a single pattern. Okay, so here we're harvesting daylight in the morning and the evening hours, harvesting and driving it down in the tube while rejecting the high intensity daylight. So it's a much more controlled daylight than a traditional skylight. Once we get it into the tubing, we transfer it through a rigid tubing um, at a 99.7% rate um, with a color rendition rate, so we're, we're actually not having any color shifts of, of close to 100 as well. Once we get it down to the bottom, we're gonna, the real important part is how do we let the light loose into the room or diffuse it? So either we're gonna use like a, a broad spectrum or tighter collimated beam to drive the light down. This is the big difference between traditional skylight and hybrid skylight. Target the daylight down to its intended target. So is it okay if I walk around here? Sure. If I could just add, Pat, um, there are 10 skylights already in the fire station. They're covered up. So as he's explaining this, we already have the skylights. He, th this would just be added. Why well, We're not going to replace them with skylights, but actually use this product. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware. Sorry. So here I have, and, it's, and I'll, I'll move this around, but here we have three different diffusers, and it would look just like any other light fixture. You look up and you see a lens covering it, okay? So everybody can see the translucency of these are a little bit different. Now that's how we diffuse the light in the space. So just imagine these are three separate rooms here, okay? This first one here, I'm going to have a more collimated beam. Okay, so it's going to be a tighter 
band that drives the light deeper in the space, okay? This one here is gonna be a little bit wider, so it's gonna broadcast out over the room. We'll let the walls reflect in some other objects like the space. And then this one here is a super wide, so maybe you have a small office, a corridor, or a bathroom that you're looking to do. So it's very important versus the traditional skylight, we're able to control that down to its intended target. Now if we go to the last slide here, we can kind of see a few examples. There we go. Of some different applications. In the upper left, we have a, a fire station. Now I know we do have um, a larger uh, shaft that we are looking to replace one of those skylights in there. And that would be a product that we use on the upper left in, in, in that example. And that one just has a more collimated beam. It's a much larger tube, it's 29 inches, so it's gonna produce a lot more daylight, but it's gonna drive it deeper into the space. Um, the second example over in the middle there on the top, that one there at Jackson Gray is exactly what we're looking and proposing for this project, along with the one on the lower left at the Quality Bicycle Products. And then I just threw a couple others in here. For example, um, the McCray School there is actually a single source light. So that one has a high efficiency LED in it, as well as natural daylight. So both are coming out of this, the same product. And then a couple different examples on other municipal projects. If anybody wants to see the dome, I do. It's, it's kind of neat to see the laser reflect the, the light back down, show what it, its optics do, so thank you. Good evening, I'm Alejandra Polinka, Director of Creative Placemaking, and I wanted to touch a little bit more on some of the art opportunities for the building. So the Creative Placemaking Commission is really excited to continue our support of the Small Business Center, both in the physical space and in future programming. And so expanding the capacity of local artists and supporting the arts and culture sector within Bloomington is really an important part of our creative placemaking work. So we have worked with Alliance to identify various opportunities, both on the exterior of the building, in the outside space, and within the building as well. And these art components will really help foster a more creative, inspiring, uh, welcoming, and unique, unique place to work. And it will also provide job opportunities for local artists, entrepreneurs. So some of the external art opportunities have been touched on today, such as uh, custom design on those perforated screens. Uh, we're also planning on having pad displays for exterior sculptures, mural on the building, maybe art embedded into the patio flooring, and that could be tile or painted surface, um, or vinyl graphics applied to exterior panels. Some of the internal art opportunities, and that's what you're seeing on the screen here, um, could be entryway art. And so that could maybe wrap from the exterior of the building into the vestibule area, which would create a really welcoming atmosphere, but also just highlight the main entrance of the building. Murals or a picture rail for rotating art displays. Display cases, either for art or maybe for products that are being designed or created with for users within the space. A sculptural piece or mural in the tower room. And we also, in general, just talked about maybe incorporating some of the old used equipment from the fire station as part of the art um, projects to just honor the history of the building. So we're currently working on prioritizing the art projects so that they align with the construction timeline. And we anticipate there to be several phases in implementing this work. And I think there's a benefit in having phases because we can consult with future users of the space to identify what they'd like to see in the building and so that they can also have some ownership in maybe selecting future art projects or artists. Um, it also allows us just to get a better grasp on how the space is being used once it's built and people are actually inside of it. So once we have priority projects identified for 2024, we'll start right away in fine tuning the scope of work and proceed with the artist selection. So there, thank you. Thank 
you, Ollie. Does anybody know where the power button is on this? No? Okay. Um, apologize for looking behind, but um, some of the update for what we've been doing uh, surrounding community engagement since we were here last in December. Of course, we continued with our advisory committee, and so our advisory committee met for 10 meetings. Uh, we concluded that work in April earlier this year. Um, we really used the advisory committee that you heard earlier from Alliance to really inform what that space looks like. And um, back in April, uh, we had quite a party, and so the mayor was there, and we also had Hennepin County Commissioner Gotel um, and also Council Member Martin and the project team and a whole bunch of people just to have a party and celebrate the work that they did um, because it was really a lot of work. Um, then we also uh, presented Carla and myself to the Multicultural Advisory Committee out of our own police department, uh, public health, and also creative placemaking. Uh, earlier in June, we were at the farmer's market. Uh, so one of the sub-consultants with our team is Juxtaposition Arts, and so they really assisted in our engagement activities that we performed. And it was also really important that we engage youth. Um, so that is one of our priority groups. Um, just as a reminder, it's BIPOC-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, youth, and artists. And so we engaged a number of youth from Blooming Meadows, which is an apartment building uh, adjacent to this business center. And they assisted us at all of our events so far, and they'll also be there uh, this weekend as well. So at the farmer's market, one of the things that we did is we asked, if you were to create a small business, what would it be? And then we had that recorded on the cardboard disc that you see in the picture here. Um, and we also had characters. <laughs> that, that definitely was a different activity um, for our crowd at the farmer's market, and people were a little hesitant to do it. Um, but we got a number of people um, to um, participate and give us our ideas. Um, so that was a lot of fun. You'll see a picture here. Um, another thing that we did um, that you see some of those objects there that the folks are using at the workshops. Uh, we had one at Blooming Meadows, and then we also had one that was actually at the fire station. Um, so what we use there is an inclusive sensory-based activity. Uh, this originated by James Rowhouse, who is a well-known urban planner, community activist, and artist. And really what we did with this activity is to cross that language barrier. And so what people were asked to do is to design something that they enjoy in their community, whether that was as a child, um, in a different community than ours, but what does that look like and what would they like to have in the new business center? Um, so that, um, afraid to almost push us. This is a temporary art installation that's out at the fire station currently. So it went up as colorful, um, and it was uh, designed by youth out of juxtaposition arts again, uh, using youth as part of this project. And so it was put up, and then um, after they participated at the farmer's market in the workshop at Blooming Meadows, it was really fun to see um, that they took the responses on those cardboard discs, and the people that were at the workshop were actually able to go there after the event and see their ideas on there. So um, the, the um, students were the artists for this and put that up there. Um, you'll see on the left, that's Harmony Harrison. She's a young artist um, that participated. And then um, the attend a uh, couple of the attendees that were at the Saturday workshop at the fire station. So we do have an open house that's happening this Saturday um, from 11 to 2. And we're going to have a number of activities there. We will have a working fire truck with firefighters, so um, encouraging the kids to get on the fire truck. We'll also have an ice cream cart to enjoy free ice cream and balloon animals. Um, we uh, will also have a project team and employees there to talk through the renderings and what the space is meant to be. Um, we're also going to have an artist there, uh, Papa Embe, and he's a co-founder of the ITS Festival, which is an annual festival that allows for black-owned spaces that spark purpose and create positive life experiences for the BIPOC communities. 
And as he's creating this music with the input from the participants, he'll do a final recording for us that will be part of this project um, that people can listen to. And Jeff, welcome Jeff. Thank you so much, Barb. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. President. Good evening, distinguished members of the city council and commissioners and dedicated city employees. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present this evening. My name is Jeff Aggie, and I'm the founder and CEO of 2043 SBC. And the City of Bloomington Project is the only project that I personally work on. So it's very <laughs> important and special to me. Now, before I started my own business in 2012, I was a church kid who grew up in the church. And we had this interesting concept that if you build it, they will come. And so folks just built bigger churches, but unfortunately, churches got emptier and emptier. Next year's project that will come up in 2024, hopefully in the fall, is an amazing project. You've heard about how amazing the building is, the interior, the exterior. But it only matters if the target audience that we're looking for views it as their home. One of the things that struck me in my first opportunity with working with the city is I didn't know that there was a city uh, office that had a art, uh, almost a museum, really a museum. Does, has anyone ever seen a city building that has a museum? All righty. For the record, there are no hands up at this moment. Uh, has anyone been to a city um, hall that has a pond that has a promenade in the back of it? Oh, one person. We have one person. The beauty of this city is in the folks who work with it, but also in the building that exists that a number of people have no idea that exists. I didn't know it existed until... I began to consult with the city of Bloomington. And so what, we'll, what you'll see here is more than just the concept of if you build it, they will come. It's the design thinking principles that we have to build whatever we're building with our end users in mind. And so before we even have a building, before we even have a space, we are going to create space here that always existed and that's always been for the constituents, that's always been a remarkable place that people want to be we're just going to cultivate it even more for the small business community. Mary Bussey oftentimes uses a, the analogy of a garden. And you know, if we're thinking about the next year's project as it opens being a tree that's planted or the harvest, what we'll be doing between now and then is really cultivating that ground. And what it looks like is bringing stakeholders as well as our, um, the small business owners, uh, youth, uh, women, BIPOC owners, really all business owners, really when we say those terms together, they just mean a space where everyone is welcome. We are going to start doing that right here at the plaza, a very beautiful place that folks will begin to, they already have, folks already have a relationship with the city, but this will be a place where they feel like it's theirs. So by the time a new building opens, they already have that relationship with the city. And I'm not saying that they don't have that relationship yet. But one thing that struck us um, was during our engagement with the community, there's a former business owner here. He's owned a business for the last 30 years. And he said, prior to this committee, I had an adversarial relationship with the city. It felt like the small business community had an adversarial. He said, you know, this experience has completely changed my view and how I view the city. Sometimes perception is reality. And what we'll be doing here is not only changing perception, but creating value for people. So coming to the city will be a value add that they see. So that as we transition uh, folks over to the Small Business Development Center, they'll have that same experience that they have right here at City Hall. And so here are a couple of things that we'll be doing between now and the winter. Uh, next slide. I'm not sure if you're seeing it. So here are a couple of things that we'll be doing uh, between the fall and the winter. The first thing is a venture night at the plaza at the end of October, early November. So imagine it's not, hopefully it's not snowing. It's, you know, getting cool. And there's a beautiful venture night here at the plaza. And what that venture night will do is it will bring stakeholders together, as well as small business owners, as well as artists, as well as young people in this wonderful space that we have where they can receive the services that they're looking for. They can connect with one another. And hopefully 
you'll be invited. They can connect with the folks who work hard every day to make this city what it is. And in doing so, it will continue to kick off for next year what will be the continuous process of bringing community into space. But even before we get into that venture night that brings stakeholders together, so you might think about a, a partner who might be a sponsor, you might think about a partner who might be bringing services, and as well as the people who are receiving their services, before then we want to have workshops right here at the Black Box Theater. The Black Box Theater is a wonderful resource. I'm the kind of person who truly believes that the city of Bloomington in general is an underutilized resource that people don't see, but especially the black box, using the black box to have seminars. So as we're thinking about youth, uh, women-owned businesses, BIPOC businesses, to begin to have seminars there in September, in August and September, so folks are actually receiving training. One of the benefits of working with 2043 and working with uh, the folks at um, the small business uh, center that's coming up and working with community development is as we're bringing all those partners together, we have the best of the best people that will be willing to do seminars for the kind of entrepreneurs and the kind of small businesses that we're looking for for free. So these are seminars that could be up to $1,500 that they would have to pay for, but there'd be no tuition because it's being done here in partnership with the city. So folks are immediately getting that kind of value. So they're getting that kind of value. They're getting that kind of training, which will lead up into our big venture night at the plaza. All righty. So lastly, when we build it, they will come because they've already been coming. All we're doing is changing an address. Thank you. So we've been a little busy. Barb's going to talk about kind of our timeline. I know uh, Commissioner Peterson wanted us to move it up six months, <laughs> but we're trying. So we're at the point right now um, where the um, construction documents were at 60%, and so we have applied for a building permit. So we're working through the process so that we can do um, city approvals as we're still building it out. So that will cut down on the change orders once we're actually under construction. So we're working on those construction documents right now. We expect to be at 90% on August 24th um, and go out to bid for a general contractor in uh, end of September, uh, beginning of October kind of looking at the time frame that we're going to start building in the spring. Um, we've talked this through. We could probably start earlier, but there's no sense. Uh, the construction timeline is six months, and so there's no sense in starting yet this winter. So we would do that in the spring. Um, and then our opening would be late 2024. As many of you know, we have a number of grant funds that we have to use by the end of 2024. So uh, talking to purchasing and also um, to our public works folks, that that timeline works good to um, get on the docket of general contractors uh, for first thing in the spring. So uh, getting that out in October. All right, so the next slide is our money slide. Um, <laughs> uh, Barb's been excellent at going out and getting funds, um, particularly from Hennepin County. Uh, we did, I don't want to say shake down the HRA for half a million dollars, <laughs> but um, we will be coming to the port. Uh, Holly's aware that, um, you know, she might have some unspent funds. Uh, and so you'll be looking for that. Uh, we did have a million dollar congressional direct directed spending request. We did get an email today that we are not going to be funded. We have put this on our, tell me Mike again, no priority for bonding. 2024 bonding request from the state legislature. Yes. The other thing that, because um, we, we're really, I don't want to say shaking people down, but uh, Lori Economy Scholler, I said, you know, U.S. Bank, like, we, that's they hold all our money and so I said who's our relationship person so Lori sent an email introduced me um, we ha have put out a request that we would like our financial institution to help support this as a grant um, and so we have a couple other I don't want to say tricks up our sleeve but we have some other venues that we're going to be pursuing but um, I just want to let you know I think we've raised Two and a half, two million, some, give it. One and a half million. But a little additional, yeah, yeah. close to two million okay. with uh, 
with art funds from Creative Place making yes. as well. Um, so we'll be looking to the port, Mr. President, and um, and any. Buddy who has some suggestions, uh, but I'm pretty confident we're going to be all right. And our final slide. Oh, the one thing I thought, Barb, maybe you could touch on is our relationship with public works and how other city departments have stepped up and said, hey, we have a road construction project. Why don't you, you know, like time it so that mm -hmm. we're not digging in the road one um, more than once. Maybe talk a little bit about that collaboration. Right. So working with Darren Rezac in, in Public Works, um, there's an 86th Street overlay happening this summer. And so as part of that work, some of the upgrades that we need to the small business center to house people, um, some of that work is being paid for through this project um, up to the building. Um, so that's saving us some costs there. Uh, also keeping in, in close contact because as you may or may not have been over there here recently, there is work happening right now by utilities and that is center point. Um, so being in close contact with Public Works who's in contact with center point to make sure that that project is accomplished in front of the fire station by Friday this week in preparation of our open house. Um, there's that, and then also working um, with Public Works, uh, Deb Williams, she works on some of our larger projects. She's been working on the fire stations, on the construction of that, and having them as a partner when we started getting down to more of the nitty gritty on the construction. And so her and her team have a process, so when we do the invoices for the billing, they have a whole process on how we move this forward. So uh, they'll be stepping up to take the lead, also, our building and inspections department, um, working with a general contractor, we can have our inspectors out there more often to have eyes on the project as well. So and Maybe you mentioned the help we got from planning in terms of kind of advising us on some of the things oh. that, may, that don't trigger... Um, yeah. Getting a variance. Yeah, thinking thinking outside of the box a little bit and, and working obviously with our architects on um, our parking and what that looks like and how we can um, avoid a variance to avoid a timeline delay. Um, also working with Aon um, as our partner with Blooming Meadows and working on a shared parking agreement. Um, they've been extremely uh, agreeable to work with um, and really want this to be a successful project. As as Carla has said many times before, at Blooming Meadows, we have built-in clients there and a lot of them. Um, over 400 and the people that attended the workshop, they were neighbors that were in close vicinity and extremely interested in this project and very excited and want it open tomorrow as well. Um, so I, I think I just wanted to comment that having a public partner as well as Aon helping us with that parking. And so when we have larger events, additional parking, we could use our parking. All right. So with that, we happy to entertain any questions. Yes. Well, well thank you. That's a, a comprehensive look and a, a lot of detail that I think is it, it's interesting and it's very exciting also to, to look at the, the thought that went into it and um, the the possibilities around how the building will look, will act, will feel, will welcome people. It's, it's, it's very exciting to hear. So well done on all of that. And Mr. President? What I'm excited about, I think it's another front door for Bloomington. And what you're trying to do is to say to a lot of people that may be intimidated by coming into this building that this is going to be a very user-friendly space that will get them in and have services and things. So uh, you know, particularly if you're starting a business or something, you're looking for any help you can get and stuff, so I think that's that's going to be very good. So, we have Port Authority questions or council questions. Mr. Luntz, I'm the building guy. I got to ask. Push your button. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the building guy. Just two simple questions. You have a have you developed the evolved the total budget, and then what's the gross square footage of the building again? Uh, the square footage of the building, the usable space, um, is just slightly under 6,000 square feet. That's what, I, that's what I had in mind, okay. And this will be a city building maintained by our facilities um, group from Public Works. And so what we will do is we will be paying the... I don't even know space what and occupancy. Thank you, Barb. Um, we'll be paying into that fund and it will be maintained 
by city staff. Mm -hmm. And they have been at all of our, just about all of our meetings, the facilities team weighing in on the skylights and so forth and, you know, asking all the questions about maintenance and and all of that. Mm -hmm. So they've been part of us. So is there a gross cost budget goal for the readaptive use conversion? For the construction? Well, yeah. It's the door open, the patterns, the designs, the art. I mean, it's, it's I think we're almost at three and a half million. Is that? Uh, that would be total for the project. The whole uh, thing, architect. Mm-hmm, okay. For the whole Engagement. entire project. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, and look forward to hearing from you again in six months as we get to some next milestones on all this. So thanks. Next on our agenda are uh, item three. It's our hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. And somewhat uh, different for a, a Port Authority meeting, we actually have public hearings. We, I know we've had them in the past, but we don't have them very often at the Port Authority. So we have uh, a couple of public hearings that we're going to get to, uh, but we'll start with item 3.1, and this is uh, a resolution authorizing an application to Livable Communities Demonstration Account, a transit-oriented development grant. And we'll wait for the doors. All right, Mr. Mayor, is he, Mr. Mayor, excuse me. Mr. Mayor. Yes. Is your, is your um, mic on? Because you were very hard to hear there, and I wasn't sure if your mic was on or not. My mic is indeed on. I okay. might have been a bit far from it, or okay. you might have been a bit too close to the door open as well. Yeah, <laughs> so, thanks. Let's see. Uh, yep, my mic's yes. on. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mr. President. Uh, this is actually not a public hearing. Uh, this is a little different uh, than we usually do it, um, but this first item here is, uh, will be a resolution to submit and support a grant application to our LCDA, our Livable Communities Development Account grant, uh, Transit Oriented Development. There's kind of two different grants that the Met Council puts out. Normally this would go on your consent agenda, uh, but we thought this would be a good idea to do this and introduce the next item. They're both kind of related. So most uh, the council should be familiar with this project. They just approved it last week for their entitlements, but uh, for the sake of the Port Authority Commission that's here today, uh, 1801 American is uh, the next phase in our Penn American district. You can see we have the district apartments that opened. Uh, this is kind of the continuation of that and was just approved for entitlements um, just south of Southtown here uh, off of Knox American. It's off of the orange line bus rapid transit line there. So you can see those kind of star icons are the station. It's literally adjacent to the station. So that's why they're going after the transit oriented development grant. Uh, the grant, and I'll keep this short, um, is supporting density around transit stations. They're trying to connect affordable housing and other economic activity to the transit. Um, and obviously being next door, this is a natural fit for that. And they're also supporting sustainable elements or some kind of elevated approach to the development. So in this case, this pro project will likely be submitting for uh, stormwater improvements and enhanced landscaping to really kind of tie in that public space that's adjacent to the station area. So pretty straightforward, um, but I do have a recommended motion. This is for a uh, uh, point of order. This is just the city council that would be approving this. Uh, the Port Authority, sorry, maybe next time we'll have you approve, but um, under our considerations, we thought City Council has more meetings that if we need to get on another agenda later on. We're, we're really crushed, Mike, that you're not having the Port Authority <laughs> approve it. With that, I'll entertain any questions you might have. Or Council, any questions regarding this? This one's pretty straightforward. Uh, just supporting steward companies. They seek the grant from the Metropolitan Council. If there are no questions, uh, Council, I would look for uh, a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing application and authorizing the execution of a grant agreement for the Livable Communities Demonstration Account Transit Oriented Development Grant. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember Martin to uh, adopt the resolution authorizing the application. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Thank you much. Item 
It's also me, I'm sorry. <laughs> we figured. Try that again. Here we go. Let me just say that's a pretty rowdy group going to a show tonight. <laughs> My goodness. Show's <laughs> that. Ah, it's the, it's uh, okay. Very good. It's the, they dance on the aisles in this show, so it's you know, <laughs> it's pretty rowdy in there. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. President, Council Members. Uh, Port Authority Commission members, this is the next item, also LCDA grant resolution, but we thought this would be an opportunity to talk about the 700 American project and give you a little bit of an update and a little bit more meteor item. Um, hopefully not too meaty, though. So again, refresher on where 700 American is. It's that parcel that the city owns uh, near REI, that vacant space there. Um, right next to Top Line Credit Union that is almost done with construction. Maybe it's open soon. Um, city owns that. We put an RFP out and give you a little history. And back in November, uh, we closed that RFP and council directed us to enter into negotiations with Schaefer Richardson as the developer. We worked quickly to kind of solidify it as a, that they are the name developer to do, uh, lock in the qualified census tract because they would be uh, seeking low-income housing tax credits, and it was going to lose their status, so we were able to lock that in, um, and we enter into a pre-development agreement, and then in our project timeline, we're in that kind of entitlement process, uh, kind of refining of the project, and we'll kind of go into some of the details that have changed since the initial RFP. Uh, but as we start to kind of refine that and move into the next phase, we're looking at that funding aspect, that kind of critical piece, right? They're going for the low-income housing tax credits, but there's still a gap um, beyond that that we need to fill. So the original project, we anticipated 153 units with 5,000 5, square feet of commercial space. Uh, we anticipated that they'll apply for TIF. We still anticipate that, applying for the tax credits. Uh, and other grant sources and reach out with the neighborhood. In that refining phase, we found that 153 units might have been a little too ambitious. Uh, we did some parking studies. We were hoping that REI would help by uh, providing some space that we can maybe purchase for uh, parking, knowing that that is the biggest constraint, but they weren't willing to uh, negotiate, so parking needs to be on site. Uh, knowing that there isn't any spillover into a neighborhood where vehicles can go. The parking study showed that we were deficient. We actually did two concepts knowing that it would be a constraint, kind of the 153 units and even a smaller uh, size building, and both were not sufficient enough. We would have to build a second story of uh, structured parking and then costs just balloon and the gap is, makes it unfeasible. So Schaefer has done a new uh, plan that they're working on that's 125 units. It would be senior affordable housing, which is identified as a need in our community, it would still have maintain a small commercial space that would support that as well. They believe they can accommodate the parking that's needed for that. Staff was comfortable with this change because looking at other developments that have happened in the area, uh, it's still sizable. It's still probably the densest that we've seen in that area in recent years. You can see here uh, 1801 American that we just talked about comes in at 55 units an acre. This will be 67 and a half units an acre. So still denser. There's the same, practically the same size site, but you're getting 25 more units. So that gives you a little perspective on why <laughs> the 153 was a little tight to fit on the 1.85 acres. But it also fills that need where we talk about movement in the market and people are aging in place. And this gives them another option as uh, knowing that it's an affordable option. I think many times people would like to move out of their single family home, but just there isn't an affordable option for them to move. And this gives another opportunity for that, kind of creating that backfill where people can move in the market and uh, move into the single family home that's otherwise occupied by someone who maybe would rather move somewhere else. In talking with Met Council about this, they think it's, it meets their equity goals as well, because senior is kind of one of their, uh, the needed in the region. Uh, similar goals, the LCDA 
This is not competing with the other one. The other one is the TOD, the Transit Oriented Development. This is a different program. So we're making sure we're not competing with ourselves on these grants. Uh, but again, they would be looking at doing things with sustainability, stormwater, creating that kind of public feel with uh, enhanced landscaping, uh, similar aspects to try and uh, make it a better project. And of course, the affordable units would be in there as well. And so this really kind of fills the gap that we anticipate um, as we move forward in the project. Uh, and I have any questions? Uh, Schaefer might be on the phone. They might not. They actually ended up having another public meeting that they needed to attend as well. So they're trying to juggle both meetings. But uh, I can make a first attempt if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, you know, knowing that this is a little bit different than the RFP, this would be kind of showing your support for the grant application and the project moving forward as well. Mike, I see uh, Commissioner Peterson has a question. Yeah, so um, one of the questions that came to mind when, I, when you were talking was around the kind of affordability component. And could you refresh my memory, if, if I'm a senior who's on a fixed income but I have some equity built up in my house, how does, how does the affordability calculation work in that situation versus the situation where maybe you know, somebody is working but maybe does, maybe is renting or something like that. I just that was trying to remember how that worked. That is a little bit different. Um, trying to remember now with how your assets are calculated versus because yeah, if you do, you can, have come, that equity, you can come back. You can come back later too. You don't have to answer that. Exactly it's not a quiz. So, Jason, do you? Uh, my colleague Jason Smith, help me here. Mr. Mayor, Mr. President, commissioners, and council members, um, we definitely will get back to you on this just to confirm. Uh, but we would, when we did take a look at this on a previous uh, development, um, we were informed that uh, it, it's basically their income, what their, um, what their W-2 and what their tax returns state as far as their annual income in determination uh, for the affordability. And so sometimes, depending on how fast their assets could be depleted, depending on other expenses that uh, individuals may have, um, the program most likely just focuses on what their annual income is. Okay. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Quick follow-up question for you uh, related to that. What qualifies someone as a senior in the case of that? Is it 55 plus? Is it 60? What is the, what's the There are age? some distinctions, but usually 55 plus is that starting age. Okay, thanks. Um, and specifically to uh, Commissioner Peterson's question, I assume that a reverse mortgage counts as income, but can you add that to the things you just check on to make sure we figure that out? Thank you very much. Councilmember Moore. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm interested to understand how this change really fits with the RFP. Um, given the dramatic reduction in the commercial square footage, the reduction in the, the number of units, and switching to a senior f facility, does it match the area and the original intent that we had intended when we put out the RFP for this particular lot? Yep, Mr. Mayor, Councilman Ramua. Yeah, it is very, it is very different. I think what working closely with um, the developer, Schaefer Richardson, I think the end product here is what we would have seen from any developer. Um, knowing we had this ambition with the RFP, and that is why we selected them, it was an iterative process. They did the parking study. They worked with the REI. They kind of showed us the steps along the way that showed that you know, any other project at 153 units probably is not going to work here without some sort of reduction. Um, and just knowing the steps that they've done, this is kind of where they've landed. And just, I think that's where staff was comfortable that they showed us that they were making their effort, they were making those attempts, they documented those study, this parking study, and working with our planning department, uh, this is kind of where it ended up. It is a little bit different than what the vision was for that area, but at the same time, it's probably the highest, best use that we could have for that area. Um, otherwise, we're looking at putting another RFP out, and what's going to happen is probably 125 units senior will be the most viable option that we can get out of that, knowing that they made that attempt and kind of landed here. So that's, even at 125 units, it's probably 
from what we're hearing, is probably still ambitious. And it will be a four-story unit building uh, with underground parking. So it's, it will be a substantial development, just maybe not as substantial as we initially thought. Councilmember Lohman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, you had a slide earlier because um, I was thinking the, the very thing that my colleague was thinking, you know, and then I thought about the history of, of this lot and how long it has been uh, around, the <laughs> around the bend here. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more um, about that history because there's some of us who you know, haven't had that opportunity to, uh, to see that. And then the other thing that I wanted you to mention um, after you're done doing that is you'd mentioned there might need, be a need for additional help to kind of get this over the, uh, uh, over the, uh, the line here to get, to get her done. So thank you. Yep, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman. So you're right, it does have a kind of storied past. Uh, this parcel was created because of uh, American Boulevard, the widening of American Boulevard, created 700 and 900 American, where top line credit unit is. It was originally sold to Frown Chu developer, and then they sold 900 to top line, and they were going to develop 700 into, I believe it was a 30 or 40,000 square foot uh, office, medical dental office. Uh, that did not move forward. They ended up selling it back to the city. So then we did an RFP, uh, was it 2000, I'm blanking on the 2007. Uh, and at that time, that was the office development, it was 2007. So 2012 was uh, another RFP and uh, after working on that for several years, High V came along, but again, similar situation. They promised more, the development got smaller and smaller until eventually they didn't think it was feasible either. So this is, does seem to be a theme with this site where we come in with grand ambitions and it gets a little bit smaller and smaller until it doesn't come to fruition. So this is now our kind of third attempt at this and hopefully we are able to overcome the gap. So hopefully the last, right? Uh, so they are pursuing low-income housing tax credits, so there are some hurdles still. They do need to get awarded that. That is competitive. That will be in January when they would apply for that. This grant helps fill that gap, gap too. So if they don't get this grant, then there's other. They do have other grants that they are pursuing that they are aware of that are kind of backup options, but um, they're hoping for this grant to kind of give that kind of sol solid moving forward because... When this is awarded, then it kind of leads into that low-income housing tax credit and kind of gives you um, a better, you know, if you're funded, a better application for the, that credit process. Um, and then there is, again, that TIF ask that would likely happen, and we'll kind of anal analyze what that gap is and uh, determine what is sufficient to fill that if that is possible. Well, Council Member Lohman anticipated my question because I, I've remembered we've we've talked about this for a long time, and so I think, I think clearly there's been a lot of chances for the highest and best use to emerge, and uh, this seems to be what has emerged, and and it's still a pretty good project. I mean, that's a lot of density, and 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 again, senior housing and things. So I I think it's something we should be happy to have happening. You know? Yeah, these are independent senior for independent yep. seniors. Okay, and then uh, where's the access? Is, is it the where's the curb cut at? Is it it's further west, um, off north, and then back around? Huh? Yes. So, Mr. Mayor, President Erickson, uh, Commissioner Lunds, um, still just the main access off of uh, American Boulevard here. Uh, there is that is where their easement. Um, is with REI. Uh, there is no easement access um, off of Lindale. Okay. And the only other thing, I was just wondering what the thought patterns were on walkability, which I think are, are really important to seniors. Yeah, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, President Erickson, Mr. Lunds, you can see it is pretty built up. It is pretty auto-oriented, but at the same time, there, there are wider sidewalks on American Boulevard, so it is, you know, safe and well-kept to get you to kind of that Pan-American district, which is 
just outside a half mile. Um, they are very close to being in that TOD zone. Uh, I think it's like right at the top line where it kind of cuts off. So um, there are some amenities in the area. It's it's not perfect, albeit it's not next to a, a park right adjacent to it, but there is um, not too far, about a half mile in all directions is kind of where things are. And actually, Commissioner Lunds anticipated my question uh, because I was going to ask also about walkability, considering the change in population that's going to be living there. Mm -hmm. And uh, and actually, you might have as well, because I was also thinking in terms of transit oriented, uh, if it is, uh, we, we can envision a, a scenario where low income seniors might need direct access to transit. Yes. And uh, I, I know we do have buses running up and down Lindale. We have buses on American Boulevard as well. Yep. But I also, I, I just want to make sure as we move forward with this, we keep that in front of mind, both the walkability and the transit access uh, within that within that area. Yep, Mr. Mayor, that is a great point too. There is a transit stop right here uh, that feeds directly into the orange line. That's kind of, Met Council's done a, a, a good job of making sure that they have these feeder lines that are kind of, we have a north, high quality north south and making sure that east west can connect to it real easily so it is a it is high frequency that goes there so commissioner hunt had a question hey Dan, I, in more comments, I, I, I wouldn't consider that area offhandle it is a, a walkable area by any means um the other thing is, is commissioner can, if you could turn your microphone on please i kind of forget that all the time the other thing coming out of that site and it's been a while since i've done that but coming out of rei and that site and going east is horrendous at times mm -hmm. and I, I, you know you're ideally you're not going to put another stoplight there just because of the proximity to to uh, um, Lindale but what does that do in the traffic studies for that volume of, of uh, residential coming in there along with you know hockey and REI yeah. and it, it's a congested area already yep uh, mr. mayor president Erickson Mr. hunt you are correct it, it, it will add some traffic um, the good news is residential tends to have a little bit different peak hours than retail uh, traffic does, so you're, it'll be a little bit different. There is opportunity at some point potentially to add an access off of Lindale that could address some of that left uh, turning so you can turn right and then have, you'll have a signalized intersection there to get you to that left. Um, so there, there are some options in the future if it does become an issue. Um, but I think the initial studies have shown that it, it can handle the increase. Councilmember D'Alessandro. I, I, I thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, what, what, um, what is the net benefit to the project to going from 125 units period to 125 senior units? Like, what does that do? Is there, are there grants that they can apply for that they otherwise wouldn't? Because I would think that you might need to increase your accessibility requirements here because of, uh, of senior living. I mean, what, what's the trade-offs there? Can you help us out with that? Thanks. Yep. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, President Erickson, Councilman D'Alessandro, uh, the benefits are one, it's a it's a built-in market, you know, a high need, right? That seniors we know booming population or mean that. Um, car dependency is a little bit different because at some point you do get to an age where you're driving less. So uh, the need for parking is less than just uh, what we were originally proposing. Part of the issue with what we were originally proposing, we had large units which were driving a higher parking count. So that's why they did kind of a second option with lower units, smaller unit size, and it still was driving that because you tend to have roommates with two cars or, you know, so we have different parking standards and uh, parking generation from a senior perspective. Um, so those are the, kind of the two issues, your built-in market and that, that parking that's helpful. Thanks. Real quick follow up, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> so, um, are they coming back with development plans that do have consideration for a higher requirement for accessibility? I would assume also, for example, kind of to the point of Commissioner Hunt with the transit, you'd want to have a larger space for like the Metro Transit, you know, mobility access buses and all that kind of stuff. Can you explain a little bit about the thoughts there? And if you can't, I get it. The Developers not here that might. Yeah, they're working on their fit plan. I haven't seen it yet, but I think they're very close on that. Um, they they kind of have to have something ready for this grant. So 
Um, but uh, that will be a consideration working with our planning department. That is something we're always looking at and pushing developers for to have that connection, to have those considerations. But I, th I think they've, they're very cognizant that you need those pick up and drop off areas and you need to be able to have those connections and spaces for people on site to just congregate and be outside because they might not be able to go. Just senior in general might not be able to walk a long distance to get to a park. So having that on site is something that we'll be pushing. Yeah. Right, and in fact, um, is that grant is that grant going to include potentially you, like re revamping the the bus stop that's there so that there's like heaters and other things like that that allow for that? Do you know? Um, that could be a potential. I know Met Council or Metro Transit they do have some standards around that that um, gets into some equity issues that they've uh, got in trouble in the past. But when you do privately initiated uh, enhancements, then the areas were more affluent tend to have a lot of that and then not, not. so it, there's some rules and guidelines that they have in place but I think that's something we can approach Metro Transit about yeah so this is an information only item for the Port Authority Council unless there are other questions I would look for a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing application and authorizing the execution of a grant agreement for the livable communities demonstration account grant so moved second Motion by Councilmember Lohman, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to adopt the resolution on item 3.2 this evening. <laughs> Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Just because of my late arrival, I will abstain from this, even though I was prepared, but I didn't hear the entire presentation. Okay. So, Thank you, Councilmember. Councilor, is there any additional questions? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? And with Councilmember Nelson abstaining, Passes 5 0. Thank you very much. Item 3.3 is a resolution approving the Bloomington Central Station TIF district extensions. Mr. Schmidt, good, night. good evening. All right. Good evening, Mr. President. Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, and Commissioners. Uh, tonight before you is um, an item that was on the city's legislative policy this year. Uh, the city worked with McGuff uh, Properties uh, to extend the five-year TIF rule by an additional five years, as well as to extend the duration limit of the Bloomington Central Station TIF District another five years out to December 31st of 2044. Um, the five-year rule allows, requires development activity for a TIF district to be finished within that five-year period. And so because it's a multi-phase project, this is very difficult to always um, have all those multiple phases complete within five years. So any district that is multi-phase usually goes to uh, the state legislature requesting this five-year deal. In addition, the extension of the TIF district um, is the ability to collect increment for TIF eligible expenses within that uh, time period, and that extension was for five years, which was part of the city's policy this year. The requested action tonight just approves this legislative extension of the BCF TIF district. It does not approve any future financial assistance towards any projects. Any financial assistance for future projects would need to be analyzed by staff and then presented before the boards uh, for action and approval by you. Minnesota statute requires a majority vote of the City Council Port Authority as well as the Bloomington Public Schools and Hennepin County for this special law to become effective. And so tonight we are asking uh, the City Council and Port Authority to take action on that as well as we will be forwarding resolutions to the Bloomington School District as well as Hennepin County for their action. Once, um, if all bodies do approve that, that information will be sent off to the state um, legislature uh, for approval um, and basically enacting this special law. And so with that, I have two considerations for you for action and I am open for any questions. Thank you, Jason. Council, any questions? I, I saw, I'll just ask the question, I saw the the, the schematic that you just had up there, the uh, especially letter I down at the bottom there, the future office. Um, are there are there any is there anything in the hopper or is there there's just a lot of possibilities floating about is what I understand. Is that correct? Mr. President, correct. Um, we are currently in conversation. Oh sorry, Mr. Mayor, <laughs> Mr. President. <laughs> you can be both no, <laughs> 
Commissioner Bussey. <laughs> there you go. That works <laughs> too. Mayor. Um, I apologize for that. Um, we are in discussions with McGough right now with regards to their next phases um, on the north, so north of Carbon 31. Um, initially, the future office is just right now in their PDP planning with zoning and, and entitlement. They are in negotiations out there. It, it comes down to the market. Um, we would love to see something happen there. And um, if it comes to fruition, we will be before this board presenting that. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. I just would like to make a historical comment. I mean, 30 years ago, or maybe more when we started looking at this, if we could look at what's actually happened there and would have known that at the time, we would have probably said we're very, very happy with what has happened because this has been a tremendous amount of development and the, the housing and everything else. And McGuff has really been a very patient developer working with us. So it's something that I'm delighted that we have this opportunity to do. Couldn't agree more, Mr. President. I, um, every time I am out there with people who have not been there or have not been there in a while, they are absolutely stunned at the development and they had no idea that it even exists out there. So it's a, a well-kept secret. Council, any questions? Port, any questions? So Port actually gets to be involved in this one, but yeah. um, well, Council will go second. first. <laughs> Council will go first. Um, on item 3.3, I look for a motion to adopt a resolution approving laws in Minnesota 2023, Chapter 64, Article 8, Section 3, relating to Tax Increment Financing District 1I. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember D'Alessandro to adopt the resolution uh, attached to item 3.3. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, the motion carries 6-0. And I would entertain a similar motion to adopt resolution BPA 23, approving the, 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 the laws of Minnesota 20, 2023, Chapter 64, Article 8, Section 3, relating to the Tax Increment Financing District 1, aye. So moved. Second. Second. We have, we, have, we have a motion made and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, please signify saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. That brings us to item 3.4, which I teased earlier. This is the public hearing that I was teasing earlier. This is uh, item 3.4. It's our public hearing regarding business subsidy agreement for sick development and consideration of additional development agreements for sick phase two. Mr. Schmidt. Mr. Mayor, members of council, Mr. President, commissioners, I am here before you um, to discuss and hopefully recommend for approval uh, the agreements to start the process for phase two for SIC. Uh, a number of these agreements, um, phase two agreements that we have before you tonight is the first amendment to the development agreement. We have a phase two business subsidy agreement, a structured parking lease agreement, and then a sale and transfer of parcels. A number of these items have all, um, the process was started back in 2019, um, back when the City Council and the Port Authority uh, considered action directing staff uh, to start looking at the feasibility of drafting these agreements. Uh, in 2020, uh, October of 2020, the City Council and the Port Authority did approve the development agreements and purchase agreement and ancillary agreements uh, to move forward with all of the phases for SICK kind of entering in that motion, um, and with which uh, in August of 2022, phase one did open, that's their logistics and production facility out within the South Loop area. And tonight we are before you as stated uh, to consider the approval of the agreements for phase two based on the terms that were established in the prior agreements. So just to give a quick um, summary of what that executed development agreement did, just as far as setting up this phase two, um, within the development agreement, the city is to sell SIC, the northeast and southeast and northwest parcels, so three different parcels there, uh, for their phases. Uh, the port and city is planning to build a parking ramp, as well as there's an adjustment to the land cost. The city is going to convey to the port the southwest parcel to to construct that parking ramp. And then the, uh, the city and Port Authority committed to public funding uh, for this project. And that funding was uh, divided up between each phases and I'll go get into that a little bit later in this presentation. The purchase price of the development to SICK is, was at a conglomerate of $5 million. However, that was prorated uh, per each parcel size as well as there was a reduction, a 10% adjustment 
uh, for in the Excel line consideration. Additionally, the southeast parcel, parcel which is phase two, um, the uh, SIC had the option to exercise that, and they did give notice uh, within over a month ago that they wanted to move forward with purchasing uh, that parcel and to start their construction entitlement process uh, to begin the phase two project. So just quickly on the four phases, uh, just to kind of hit on the summary. So as stated, their single story production and logistics did open in 2022. Uh, tonight before you, they're looking to start their uh, entitlement process for their headquarters, their office building, which will be on just south of the logistics space. Uh, phase three, they're projected out to 2029, which would be an addition to their production and logistics facility. And then phase four would be an addition, a second phase of the office building, as well as additional um, production. It's kind of a history of the site of where it's located. Uh, the city, city council, as well as the Port Authority uh, entertained, they purchased the interstate and the former Alpha 5 parcels. And uh, with that, um, has create, basically we demoed those sites and created a buildable ready site. Phase one is currently constructed and open um, on that parcel, on the northeast parcel. Phase two, as we are talking about today, um, so just to the south is the projected office complex, and the phase two, where it's slated here on the western parcel, or the left-hand parcel if you're looking at the screen, uh, that is where the structured parking ramp would be built. Phase three is that addition to the logistics place that's uh, just to the north there. And then phase four would be an extension on an additional parcel, as well as an extension of their office complex on the south. And if warranted and needed, we would do a parking study, an expansion of the parking ramp. So talking about the parcels again, so there's the northeast lot, which is lot one. Um, and that's where the current facility is located. That was opened in 2022. The southeast lot, or lot four, that is the parcel which, where the office complex would be built and where SIC would be looking to purchase. The southwest lot, or lot three, that is the property with which the city will convey to the Port Authority for the Port Authority then to construct the parking ramp. And so, as I just stated, uh, lot four, um, SIC has exercised that option based on their purchase agreement, um, and they would like to go ahead and purchase that lot from the city. That sale price comes out to just over $1.2 million based on that pro rata formula that I just stated, as well as that uh, reduction in cost. And just to, to let you know, back in October of 2020, the city council did approve an ordinance to convey the property for sale on this phased approach. So that's why there is no ordinance tonight. Um, it's just uh, uh, done by the resolution. And then also tonight, uh, the city, we are looking for the city to convey lot three, that's the southwest lot, to the Port Authority, with which then the Port Authority uh, will construct the structured parking on that parcel for the phases of the SIC uh, development. Public investment. Uh, there are two public investments here. Uh, we have the land price adjustment, which I had stated, and then lastly, the structured parking, that capital and maintenance uh, fee. So uh, the, right now, um, within the staff report, we, uh, we are currently working, the with, working with the architect on the design of that structured parking. Preliminary estimates for that parking ramp, all said and done, are running around $20 million. Um, and so with that, funding for our land price adjustment and the structured parking would be coming from three sources, the Carlton TIF, the South Loop Development Fund, and then the Mall of America Administrative and Reserve Fund. This table uh, has been updated um, as far as kind of breaking down our public investment summary. Um, so as you can see, uh, roughly right now, estimated price costs of 20 million for the structured parking, land write down right around $2.1 million. Uh, so the total, Maximum potential public public assistance here in phase two would be about right around 22 million, 22.1 million. Um, all in, if you add in phase one subsidy, we're at around 25.7 million. 
And then we kind of have a breakdown of the sources of where that funding is coming from. Like I stated, uh, Carlton TIF, we will be using the remaining amount in Carlton TIF. That is a TIF district that is closed. Um, and we're just waiting to use the remaining funds in that balance. Uh, administrative and reserve fund will be around 11 million. And then 50% of the parking ramp will be paid with uh, self loop development funds. So wages, so right now, uh, phase one currently has 198 employees. Mm. Phase two, existing employees or current employees that will be moving over to phase two are 169 employees um, with a projected uh, increase of 75 plus more employees on there, so right around 247. Um, so once combined, uh, this area will have about 445 employees once uh, phase two is complete and open. Uh, average uh, wage for phase two is right around 105,000. Median wage right around 94,000. So well above the 175% um, minimum wage requirement within our business subsidy agreement. So just quick outline on the, th the uh, four agreements with which uh, we're looking for consideration tonight. Uh, the first amendment to the development agreement, this is an agreement uh, between SIC, the city and the port. What this agreement is doing is just clarifying a couple items within the previously approved development agreement. One of those is amending the inflation index for the parking ramp. Before we were using the MnDOT uh, highway construction cost index. Come to find out when we were looking for it, that index is no longer used. Um, and so working with our engineers um, as well as SIC, we came up um, that the next best index that is out there is the building cost index as it relates uh, to the parking ramp. And then additionally, we're looking to amend section 4.3. This is just the time period with which SIC has to build uh, their phase two project. They had requested that we extend this out th three additional months because they will be going through two winter periods. And just without knowing our winters, uh, we wanted to add in that little buffer and security for them. The business subsidy agreement, this agreement once again is between all three parties. Uh, purpose of this is it defines the job retention and creation that is required for the public assistment, assistance with which the city and Port Authority uh, would be considering for this project. Um, as I stated, it's going to follow that public investment table uh, that I just showed you. The retention and creation of two, 247 jobs are part of uh, this subsidy agreement. And as stated, the required wage goal uh, for this is that it needs to be at least 175% of the federal minimum wage in which uh, their, their wages are well above that. Another agreement that we're looking at for consideration tonight is the Structured Parking Lease and Management Agreement. This agreement is be just between SIC and the Port Authority, as the Port Authority will be the one owning uh, the parking ramp. This agreement um, lays out that the Port Authority will construct it and that SIC will be leasing it for their phase one and two. Uh, while also utilizing the surface parking lot on the Northwest parcel. Key points in this agreement kind of lay out the hours of operation that SIC has it uh, between their for use exclusively for their business use between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, off hours, it is open, will be open for the public to park there. Um, in addition, uh, we will be looking at a shared maintenance agreement this agreement will be coming um, most likely at the September meet Port Authority meeting for that for consideration. And that agreement will outline that maintenance taxes, assessment, security, and utility costs are split 50% between SIC and the Port Authority. Uh, this parking lease and management agreement does lay that out. It does reference uh, this shared maintenance agreement. As I stated, a quick claim deed will be required for the city to convey that lot three to the Port Authority for, uh, for the Port Authority to construct the structured parking. And then lastly, there is a warranty deed and that is for between city and SIC uh, for the exercise option for SIC to be able to purchase uh, lot four uh, for their office complex. So as the mayor had stated, uh, this is a public hearing uh, for both boards. And so we would recommend that the mayor would open it as uh, in the public hearing, the uh, president would open the public hearing, uh, take any public testimony and then close it. Um, and then with that, I do have two motions uh, for the board after that happens. Um, but before opening the public hearing, I am available for any questions.
Thank you, Mr. Schmidt. Council, any questions? Clarifying questions? Details you need more of uh, for Mr. Schmidt from this evening? Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I know for uh, many developments that have come before us, especially residential over in South Loop, we had talked about convertibility of parking structures for alternative uses, uh -huh. assuming, I don't know, self-driving cars are taking us everywhere we need to go. Uh, are we anticipating this parking structure would be capable of that at some point? Is that, and is that, if it is, at all complicated by the shared use with SICK? Mr. Mayor, Mr. President, uh, Councilmember Martin, uh, this ramp will not be converted convertible, um, and I think the intention of that is that uh, we're trying to build as least amount of parking as possible um, for the facility and also to allow for uh, shared uh, parking for future uses. So um, if, if at that point uh, parking demands do decrease, we would then have availability um, elsewhere on the lot uh, to build another development with which then they would be able to share that parking ramp. Jason, with respect to that, I would think that if the ramp was constructed so that it was level in a sense instead of having slopes, that you do have a lot more ability to take and, and use it for something else, I mean, floors or whatever. So I don't know what, what the particular type of construction, but it's something that I certainly would, would look at, just to, you, you would have an option maybe to convert a floor or two floors or whatever. The other thing I just wanted to do, if, really for our new council person, I think this project is probably one of the best examples of the philosophy that we've had in the Port Authority and the City Council has supported it, a very patient development because we, we acquired this property from Interstate and others without having really any idea of what we were gonna do with it. But we said, this is too important an area to just take and let whatever is gonna happen, happen. And so it was through a, a very iterative process and it was also a process that I think because of the Port Authority and Tim Keller was on it for years in terms of participating in our, our what, what was our body, the, the, the uh, federal, trade. federal Trade Zone, that they found out about this and then actively pursued it. And so, I mean, I think it's just, uh, this whole project has just been a, a great example of, of how you can do things and look at it on a long-term basis, so. Councilmember D'Alessandro? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm, I'm sorry. Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, no worry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if this is uh, uh, a question you can answer at this point, but um, I'm just, I, I am at a point in, in my view on these things as we get closer and closer to um, 2030, 2040 in terms of our development that we were just, um, and maybe this is more for later in the, in the program here, but since we're on our last um, item, we, we, still, we still don't seem to have a, a, a consideration for um, our climate change initiatives and the South Loop is a great example of a place where I'm not 100% sure 30 years from now how we are going to convert that entire thing to something that's a lot more sustainable. And so I, I'm just wondering if the Port Authority um, or the Planning Commission or who, who is thinking about that, that the sick folk don't necessarily have to do it if we are not asking them to do it. But um, I do want to, I do want to, to, to kind of put out there that if we're talking about what it what comes down to like $7 a square foot of, of land um, that is now going to be steel and concrete, uh, and if it's a parking ramp, that's even worse, um, what are we doing to offset those conditions? And do we as a port authority and a, and a city council have a responsibility to be thinking about that in ways we weren't maybe thinking about that in 2015 or in 2020, uh, in 20, 2007 or whenever some of these projects started their long patient journey towards development. Um, so I don't know if there's an answer to this particular development or if the folks at SICK as they actually start to build this out can give us some insights into how they might do things. Um, seems like a manufacturing facility has a really big roof that could accommodate a lot of solar panels, for example, right? Or other things like that. Where, where are they in support of what we're trying to accomplish with our sustainability goals, knowing that commercial development and large buildings are the single number one greatest 
climate change problem we have in the city. I'm just curious if anybody's even talking about that. So I, maybe there's not an answer tonight, but I, I really think we need to do a different kind of thought process around that. Thanks. And I appreciate that, Councilmember D'Alessandro. And I and I won't put Jason on the spot to try and answer that question because it's I, I, it is a big question, and I think it's more of a statement, and I think a a, a policy discussion for the council to have longer term, and and the count uh, the port is authority as well. As we do this uh, public subsidy of large projects, what requirements do we place on them, and how do we do it? Yeah, on Mr. Mr. Mayor, if you, if, if you, I, I would like the port authority. Maybe this is the the right statement, and you're right. I'm I'm. It's more of a statement than a than an ask. I would like the Port Authority to care as much about our sustainability targets as it relates to transportation and commercial building development, which are the two biggest things that the Port Authority has influence over, against our sustainability targets. They're, they're, you can go to our website, they're big, they're huge, everybody knows about them, they're the two biggest things. And this body, and I don't get to speak to this body more than once every seven months or so, so I'll take my win and then you can chastise me later. But. Um, but we need to, th this body needs to think about this together. It's not just for the city council. Thanks. Jason. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro, um, I can state during our conversations with regards to uh, the design of the parking ramp and working with the officials from SIC, um, it was discussed with regards to is, could there be an option down the line where we could potentially install uh, solar panels on the parking ramp? Um, there's additionally um, new technologies coming out with regards to uh, solar on screening. Um, so that those conversations were had. I, I'm not sure with regards to the design of their office complex um, where they are with regards to sustainability on that front. Um, but we have initially had those conversations with regards to the parking ramp. It is coming down to funding um, right now for us, um, as well as for SIC, as to uh, who would um, would pay for that additional cost uh, to do it. But just making sure that it is designed, that the parking ramp is designed. So if that those funds were available, um, additional grants were available, uh, that it is able to accept uh, uh, those types of uh, advanced technologies on the ramp. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I did have a question, but just to follow up on Councilmember D'Alessandro's, um, we have a parking ramp not too far from there, over by a couple of hotels that I was in recently when I went to Hazelwood, and I plugged in my vehicle. Will there be EV charging spots in this, uh, Mr. Mayor? Uh, Councilmember Nelson, correct. There will be EV stations um, as part of uh, the requirement within this ramp. Okay, great. Um, so tangential just made me think of it. Um, it so can you go back to the slide with the employment um, and we have a requirement for retention and new in phase two has 169 current employees are those all currently in phase one or are those employees that are over in the old Shakopee industrial area or where are those employees I guess uh, Mr. Mayor Councilmember Nelson uh, they're located elsewhere within the metro in the metro okay so this would either be their other location so I think savage. Shakopee Sa Savage sorry <laughs> Sorry to my friends in Shock Me and Savage that I <laughs> mixed you up. So, um, okay. Um, it, it, do we know anything more about the one that is in the uh, Old Shakopee industrial area? What's the status of that? Is that still open? Will it be open after this phase? Or is that not something we know? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Nelson, uh, there are officials from SIC here. Um, so I could maybe let them answer that question. Okay. Um, as far as kind of their phasing of when they plan to, to move employees. Okay. Um, and do you want them to answer now or do you uh, want to? I'll, I'll defer to the mayor. Uh, why don't we, if you have another question, yeah. why don't we ask another question, then we'll bring the six folks up, then we'll open the public hearing. How about that? So my last item is, you know, Mayor, we have a public hearing here, but it's not a regular meeting. It's not uh, all that. I, I would just ask that we report out to the public at our next regular meeting so that they know if we take any action here about what it was and why. I know this has been before the council and the city a number of times before, so I, I, I think this makes sense, but just wanna make sure people are informed because I think they engage more in those meetings than this meeting. No, uh, agreed, and it will, it'll be part of the, the council minute on Wednesday. Great. So I'm gonna need bullet points, thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and yes, we certainly will report out at our next council meeting, that's a, that's a good idea. So. Additional questions, Councilmember Lohman? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, 
so uh, just a couple here real quick. Uh, so I think I've seen it many a times, the uh, the maintenance agreement being 50%. Can you give me a little bit of history on, on that at all in terms of, is that just standard, something we've seen, you know, is there a rationale behind that 50% kind of breakdown? Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Lohman, uh, the reason for that is, is based on the funding um, that 50% of this ramp or over 50% of this ramp um, potentially uh, will be available for public use um, because we are using South Loop development funds uh, to help pay for 50% of, of the parking ramp. Um, the rationale within the South Loop development funds and, and uh, uh, Julie Eddington, uh, the Ports General Counsel can help me here if I state this wrong, but uh, within the state statute, um, it limits uh, how those funds can be used and they're to be used for public infrastructure purposes with which a parking ramp is. Um, however, it can't go directly to uh, a business um, to subsidize a business. And so in this instance, we're using it 50% um, so that the facility is able to be used uh, by the public as well. And because it is public, we're then uh, sharing those maintenance costs across the board. Um, and we look at those parking lots, um, you know, the one that we will build there, how long is the lifespan of, of that, that facility there and about? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilmember Lohman, uh, it's uh, well over, uh, we're looking at at least over a 50 year lifespan of the parking ramp. Um, definitely depends on, on long term maintenance and, and how well that is, um, that is undertaken. And then finally, um, what would be the cost? I know my colleague here had asked uh, the idea of the conversion. What would be the additional cost if we tried to have something that was built that was convertible? Do we know what that would be? I mean, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lohman, uh, that's something I can definitely talk to our architect on. Um, I can definitely uh, follow up a little bit further with regards to the, the convertibility of, of, a, of a level or two um, of the existing design. Um, and definitely can do that in, in an update back to the commission and city council. I think given the, the interest that, that, that our, our council has shown around uh, sustainability, and I think we, a number of folks have brought that up, and I don't want to be careful. We really should be asking questions in this point in time, but I, I do think that'd be, I would really appreciate if we'd look at that in terms of trying to, as we're looking towards to you know, make this uh, something that can be utilized uh, for an ongoing basis. No additional council questions. Uh, Port, any? If not, then I understand we have our friends from SIG here. Maybe come up and answer the question regarding the, the employment. Is that what your question was, uh, Council Member? Yeah. Yes. Tell us. Or Good evening and welcome. Good evening. If you could identify yourself for the record and um, I, I address that if, if the council member needs to re-ask his question if, uh, if that would be helpful or if you have anything else to add to the presentation, we'd be more than happy to hear it. Thanks. My name is uh, Christian Weisner. I'm CFO of ZIG North America. I'm um, with the company for 17 years, joined ZIG North America six months ago. So I'm fairly new to, um, to the United States and the project. And with me is Taylor Lentner. Uh, I'm Taylor Lentner. I've been part of the project team since the beginning. Um, I've been with SICK for about six and a half years, and I'm on the facilities team here in, in Minnesota. Welcome. So, uh, Councilmember Nelson, did you want to restate your question? Yeah, I'll give it a shot. So, um, I am just wondering, uh, there were already employees that were in the calculations. They're coming from different places, and, and candidly, I'm just wondering about the location uh, in the old Shakopee uh, industrial area. It's in my district. So, just kind of wondering what your plans are for that area, and, and uh, looking forward to having you expand in the South Loop. But. Um, yeah, just curious what's going on there. Yeah, currently, uh, well, it doesn't say. The, currently, we have 100, uh, approximately 170 employees in um, the what we refer to the old Bloomington West facility, and the plan is to move um, those employees o over to our new campus in, in Bloomington. And we do own that facility and plan to sell it once we move over into the, the Phase two building. I would actually, uh, if, if I, I don't know. Please, I would please. Actually, actually refer to your question about sustainability. Mm -hmm. The 
the daughter of the founder of the company, of Dr. Erwin Zick. Um, she is very, uh, very um, close to sustainability. So sustainability is very, very important to her. Uh, she used to be on the su supervisory board of the Zick Group, and so sustainability is something that we look into. We've uh, already looked into uh, the options that we have for campus phase one and two. Uh, what we currently do is we look into an option uh, for uh, drilling wells for geothermal, uh, because geothermal will be the prerequisite to go to net zero. We haven't made a decision upon that uh, yet, but sustainability is definitely something that we would love to work um, with you on uh, in order to maybe we can bring our facility down to net zero at some point in time. Okay. Additional questions? Well, good. Thank you for being here with us this evening. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your support. Yep. Thank you. So if there's no further questions, uh, we will follow our recommended steps here, and uh, I will open the public hearing for the City Council to consider granting the business subsidies to SICK. And I will open the public hearing for the Port Authority Board to consider granting business subsidies to SICK. Is there anyone in the council chambers who wishes to address item 3.4 on tonight's agenda? <coughs> Matt, do we have anybody on the phone? Do we even have that set up this evening? Mr. Mayor, Mr. President, we do, and we do not have anyone okay, on the very phone. Very good. <laughs> Last call for anybody in the council chambers? I see no one coming forward. So uh, council uh, for the city council, I would look for a motion to close the public hearing item 3.4. So moved. Motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member Mua to close the public hearing on item 3.4. No further council discussion on this. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 6-0. And for the Port Authority, I would entertain a similar motion. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Luntz, second by Commissioner Hunt. Any further discussion? If not all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Yeah. Opposed? <laughs> Motion carries 6 0. <laughs> Council, any additional comments, questions on this? Uh, I mean, I will, I will say this is very exciting. I, I was on the council when the Alpha properties were purchased and was excited. You know, was, went then, uh, as, as Bob said, that it was just a, an idea. It was on spec, it was just a possibility. And to see this uh, moving forward now is, is just very exciting. Uh, it was exciting to open the uh, phase one, equally exciting phase two, and just really looking forward to phases three and four. Um, I'll tunnel on back in my later years and come back and enjoy the grand opening celebration that that will take place there. I'll be happy to do so. Uh, but I'm just very excited about this. So, Council Member Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to say that I'm very supportive of this. Um, I do know that. Uh, We'll be losing some good people in my district, uh, but it opens up an uh, opportunity for other businesses to come in to that area. And uh, the big thing that I'd like to say is I appreciate the port's focus and the council's focus on uh, a strategy of supporting our hospitality industry and diversifying our economy. And this is an exact... Um, uh, project that does that. It's it's a great win for the community to have this continue to expand. And I know when we talked about phase one, you know, there was always like, well, there's phase two and phase three, and are they going to come? And are they really? And it's happening. And uh, so thank you to SIC for continuing that path. And um, thank you to the port for supporting that. It's, uh, well, hopefully supporting that. So uh, don't want to be presumptive. Uh, but I, this this project's great. It's, I think, exactly what, as a council member, we've been looking at in terms of what we want to do for economic development. Couldn't agree more, council member. There's no further, no further comments on this. Uh, for the City Council, I would look for a resolution approving agreements with the Port Authority of the City of Bloomington and SICK Product and Competence Centers Americas LLC for Phase 2 of a multi-phased project. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Lohman, second by Council Member Mua to adopt the resolution associated with Item 3.4 this evening. No further Council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6-0. And I would entertain the similar motion for the Port Authority. So moved. 
Motion by Commissioner Hunt. Do we second. have a second? Second by Commissioner Bussey. Any further discussion? If not all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Very good. Thank you. I think, uh, Mr. President, that completes our. I, I think we see a smiling Mr. Lowman. Does he have something he wants to add? No, he, he wants to say goodbye, I think. Is what this <laughs> there, you there you go. You read my mind. He's going <laughs> to move adjournment for the council. The <laughs> move. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn the council meeting. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Yeah, I will adjourn the Port Authority. Very good. Thank you all tonight. Appreciate it.